in reception was the head of CSR for the company there greeting me. Immediately, the vibes I got from her was how much she enjoyed working with this charity. She said, genuinely, we've already extended it for two years. Like, if I could, if it were just up to me, I would extend this partnership forever. And she just went off and so passionately talked about you know, shifts in culture, specific examples of where teams had been helped, ways it had helped with client, like, it was incredible. If we're supporting this charity, if you buy this bottle, money will go to them. The company had been reticent to do it. After three months of saying, if you buy this product, money goes to the charity, they saw a 76% increase in sales on that product compared to normal times of the year, 76%. The team said to me that if you were watching his TikTok live that day, then when he showed the National Autistic Society watch, they sold 350 watches in six minutes. And he said, that is the fastest I've ever sold a watch. Hello and welcome back to the Fundraising Bright Spots podcast. This is episode 160. This is the show for fundraisers who want ideas and maybe even a little dose of inspiration to help you raise more money and really enjoy your job. This week, we are again talking to my good friend and long-standing colleague, Ben Swart. Ben, how are you? I'm very good, thank you, Rob. It's lovely to be back on the podcast. Thank you so much for making time. Now, avid listeners to our show will have heard you and I talk before about various fundraising topics, and they'll also know that one of your absolute specialisms is corporate partnerships fundraising. And indeed, that's one of the key things you help charities with, with our Bright Spot Next Level service, where we go deeper and help a charity do various things to help the whole organization tune into ways to make them more likely to win and keep valuable partnerships. And we're going to do a session today focused on partnerships fundraising. And in particular, a thing that corporate fundraisers can do to increase their confidence and ability to persuade companies to meet them and say yes at the end of a meeting and want another meeting and build partnerships. There's a particular skill set and actually belief that can really help them about the notion that partnering with charities generally and our charity in particular just is a valuable thing for the company too. How would you articulate that as top line, a useful thing to get good at? Yeah, I think that it won't be news to our listeners that a partnership can help a company. But what's the crucial things I've noticed are, one, how can I convey that value to a company in a way that makes sense to them and they believe and get? But even before that, what I've noticed is how much do I truly believe and what evidence have I got or am I searching for? that a partnership with my charity can actually really help the company. And what I've noticed is that when a fundraiser does find these types of examples and things we're going to talk about later on, it shifts their own confidence, their own belief, and in turn, the way they then talk to a company, even the way they they act right at the beginning of a meeting. And yet it can feel harder than you imagined to find this value or to look for it. Um, so I'm interested because today we're going to help someone not just with their own way of finding this sort of content and value, but also with some ideas of how to talk to a company about it as well. Yes, very good. One first thing to say is that maybe not all of our listeners necessarily agree philosophically that companies should get anything out of partnering with a charity. You know, shouldn't corporate entities be trying to make the world better? And great, they can give us some money or even raise us some money, but it's not quite appropriate that they should gain anything too. I don't think we're going to spend loads of time now persuading you of a different belief, if that just philosophically is how you think mm -hmm. the world should be. All I would say is, if that is your view, maybe corporate partnerships shouldn't be your main strategy for raising money. Maybe individuals giving, major donors giving, legacies and so on, community fundraising should be the more important part because in our experience, it is going to be quite an uphill struggle to make 
lots of partnerships and valuable partnerships happen unless at, unless at some level we have an eye on the company gaining something too. Now, it shouldn't be that the company gains, the charity gets taken advantage of, and clearly that's mm. ridiculous and should never happen. But what I believe is if the company partners, and it does a lot of good for our cause and for those we serve, and they could in some way look good or be helped to solve certain problems internally as well. A, I don't believe that's inappropriate. B, the company is likely to partner for way longer if it's genuinely win-win and in an appropriate way. Anyway, all of that said, what would you say to help someone tune in to the fundamental truth that companies can definitely gain something from partnering with charities. Thanks, Rob. I am absolutely adamant, 100% clear, that if a charity partners with a company, not only can it transform the work of the charity for good, but also it does help the company in so many different ways. And for me, the strange thing about this is, is when you start hunting out the different examples and comparisons for what life was like for a company before they started partnering with a charity and then afterwards, you realise just how much gold there is to be able to help this company, which paradoxically gives you more confidence, belief and assertiveness to make sure that when I am partnering with the company, it's damn well worth it for our charity. Like, so we are on this more even keel. Clearly, that's a lot for people to get. So if they can keep listening, they'll get there. Do you know, the thing that made me think of this most was the other day when I was turning up to deliver training and we were at the offices of a company who was supporting this charity because we were training at their offices because they'd given us this nice space. And unusually, in reception, was the head of CSR for the company there greeting me and the colleague. Um, not just to show us to the room, but she stayed with us for ages and had this lovely chat. And immediately, the vibes I got from her was how much she enjoyed working with this charity. And even when we were setting up the laptop and the wires, she was talking about how pleased she'd been. And like you could just get this vibe of how happy she was. So I just asked her, I said, like, I'm getting this sense that this partnership has been quite a good thing to work on. Is that is that right? And she said... Honestly, genuinely, we've already extended it for two years. Like, if I could, if it were just up to me, I would extend this partnership forever. Like, this partnership has had a massive effect on us. I absolutely love working with the charity. And I asked her, I was like, what is it about working with this charity that you've quite liked? I get a sense that you've noticed there are some things that are different now, whether it's with your colleagues or with others that hadn't happened before. And it was genuinely, Rob, like I just opened a tap. <laughs> and she just went off. And so passionately talked about you know, shifts in culture, specific examples of where teams had been helped, ways it had helped with client, like it was incredible. And off she went. And the thing is that for the last 10 years of working in corporate partnerships, I've got a radar out to notice when somebody at a company has sensed the value. And it's not because they've sent me an email saying, oh, we've seen a percentage increase in blah. It's you just get a sense that there's something about working with this charity that has dramatically helped them. And I've noticed that with the right sort of conversation and the right sort of questions, we can begin to find this evidence. You begin to hear things that will help you with the next company you talk to and the next company you talk to and your colleagues internally. And so for me, it was that one conversation that just reminded me, do you know what? This content is everywhere if we start looking for it. And there are three or four different areas where you can look that I hope we, we can start coming on to at various points today. Yeah, of course, some of the challenges for many of our listeners, they've got a, a partner like that. Whether or not they've done any of the specific techniques you're about to share, they do have at least one, two, three partners who are really nice to them and really grateful. And their challenge is, if only they could put that person in a room with the new sceptical company they're trying to persuade, yeah. then the new person would really get it, that it's not just about whether they're feeling kind and generous today, that genuinely some things would improve in terms of culture or the way the brand is perceived or getting employees to fill in their expenses on time because money goes to the charity. If only we could put that happy existing partner in the room with the new potentially cold or sceptical person, Lots of things would be easier for winning corporate partnerships, new business. Yeah. It's just 
practically, that's pretty hard to do. So in the absence of that magic wand, what are some things we can proactively do as a corporate fundraiser to achieve a similar effect, even if it's us doing the talking or conveying certain ideas when we need to talk and when we need to persuade someone who doesn't yet believe it? I think the first thing is to try and find these current examples from current people who are working with you. It was only last month when in the members club I was talking about this and there are a few steps. Step one is looking back at the companies that either have supported you in the past or are currently supporting you and not just to fire off an email to them asking, can you tell me some positive things you've noticed, but to try and get what you would call in mastery courses and what we train a lot about, you know, as many, a, a real conversation, uh, ideally in person or over teams or over the phone. But this starts with conversations with the, the companies who have supported you in the past or are supporting you at the moment, even if at the moment you are unaware of the value you might have added to them. Don't worry about that. For now, it's just a conversation to talk about what it was like to work with you or what they've noticed. And then in that conversation, how quickly can we start finding comparisons? So, for instance, I was chatting to an organisation last week. There's a jeweller who's on TikTok who sells very expensive watches. He's famous. He gets millions of people watching his TikToks as he almost live sells these watches. And there was one particular watch that he decided to do a cause-related marketing campaign on. If you buy this watch, then all of the profits will go towards the National Autistic Society. And he normally sells his watches on TikTok and you watch them get sold. The team said to me that if you were watching his TikTok live that day, then when he showed the National Autistic Society watch, they sold 350 watches in six minutes. And he said, that is the fastest I've ever sold a watch. And to pause, for me, we're going to look at probably three or four areas where when you do have a conversation with a company, you want to look for, in my head, I'm always looking for comparisons. What was life like before we were there? What was life like after we were there? And immediately when he says something like, we sold 350 watches in six minutes, that is faster than we ever sell watches before. But there's your comparison. And what's intriguing to me is when we start looking for these numbers, you begin to see them everywhere. I was working with another charity who said that there was a particular brand who sells cleaning equipment. And the time of year that they did their campaign with the charity, where they, on the shelves and in their advertising, talked about the work they were doing together. And if you bought this product, a donation would go to them. Um, that time of year, they saw a change in sales. And just one thing to say before this, the company wanted to do a campaign with them to talk about the work of the charity, but they were a bit reticent to do what's called a cause-related marketing. They were a bit reticent to take a cut on their sales, on their revenue. But the plucky fundraiser talked to them about, let's just test it. Let's just see what happens if at this time of year, you put your money where your mouth is <laughs> and you say, if we're supporting this charity, if you buy this bottle, money will go to them. The company had been reticent to do it after three months of saying, if you buy this product, money goes to the charity. They saw a 76% increase in sales on that product compared to normal times of the year, 76%. And now they've booked in to do the campaign next year and the year after. Of course they have. I love that story. What, what we noticed is when you start looking for, first of all, comparisons in numbers, you begin to see them, whether that is in speed of sales, like with the watches, or increase in sales, or even the first one to sell out. Years ago, I did, we did a partnership with a particular book, Childline and Marks and Spencers. I think Marks and Spencers had a partnership with Paddington Bear and they had actually bought the license to be able to sell over 20 different products of the Paddington Bear franchise with their logos on it. And one of the 20 products was a book where if you bought the book, money went towards Childline. And out of the 20 products, the book was the fastest selling out of all of the 20, including a soft, cuddly Paddington bear, which they thought would be the fastest selling. The book was the fastest selling and it needed to get reprinted. And again, there's a comparison there between this product being sold at that time and other products being sold at that time. So for me, it's, it's hunting out those comparisons. Now, 
I can hear conversations I've had with other fundraisers who say that's all well and good, Ben, but you, what if I don't have these comparisons myself, if it's especially for numbers? And I was in that situation 10, 11 years ago when I wanted to hunt out these examples and we didn't have them. So that's when I started talking to brands and marketing agencies myself. So I remember a conversation with a marketing agency where a friend of a friend was the director of their work to do with FMCG, fast moving consumer goods. In particular, he talked about the brand Fairy. And he said, did you know, Ben, that Fairy Liquid, every Christmas they have a partnership, often with a charity. For years it was the same charity, but they change it sometimes, often with a charity. And they find that their December partnership with a charity is their most profitable time of the year. That's what he said. So again, immediately there's a comparison. It was the rest of the most profitable time. And when we explored why, what is it about this time of year that makes it the most profitable? He said three things really that have stuck with me. One of them, he said, was actually most of the year, the team budgets for when they will take quite a hit on revenue. They budget for when it is buy one, get one free or two for one or 50% off. Like they budget to be able to lose that bit of revenue. In December, when they're giving 50p of each bottle to the charity, that is a far smaller loss than when they get two for one or 50% off. And so A, technically, Ben, the charity is making money and we are making slightly more. B, for customers that we're trying to talk to, ultimately it can feel like quite a transactional experience. The washing up detergent is it's essentially chemicals and water. He said, but when we work with a charity, it begins, it brings this more emotional conversation to it. We get to tweak the message. And he said, crucially, the emotion comes across within seconds. So when someone's walking down the supermarket, oh, they can see it. Normally, ad companies spend millions of pounds of brand money trying to create that emotional connection. Well, he said, our charity partnerships help us to do that. He said, and the third thing as to why it becomes the most profitable, he said is actually, even if you're a big brand, and a small brand too, the sales teams of these brands live or die by how good their relationship is with some of the leading retailers, leading supermarkets. The axis of power is actually with them, with the, with the big supermarkets, the big brands. He said, so they work so hard trying to get coffees, conversations, meetings in, the sales teams with, with these supermarkets, and it's so hard to stand out. He said, when Fairy Liquid want to try and set up a meeting with Tesco's, Waitrose, Sainsbury's to talk about what they're doing with the charity. It is so much easier. He said they're so much more open to it. And what that means is that they end up having conversations that genuinely, he said, we get better shelf space, we get better end of aisle stuff, and we get a far better relationship. It is easier for us to get conversations with key suppliers, key clients, when we are talking about a charity partnership. So he told me this stuff and it was like, boom, my brain was going mad for Actually, these are wonderful examples for me to talk to people. But for me, Rob, point number one was, let's try and find comparisons and start with numbers. Lots of these numbers were about fastest sold, increase in sales. For him, it was about profitability. But then that sort of bled into, for me, sort of area number two. If number one is numbers, then area number two is relationships. So just for clarity, Ben, when you say relationships, Partnering with a charity can help a company improve the quality of various relationships that are important to it, right? Yeah. So again, back to comparisons. If I were talking to a company, I just want to know what are those relationships, those areas of your business where you just wish things could be slightly better and they could be external, they could be internal. So for instance, yeah, I, talking to our current suppliers, talking to supermarkets and big retailers. It could be internal. I remember talking to a head of HR who said, you know, one of the biggest bits of feedback we get in our staff engagement is how people feel like we're siloed. We feel like as a team, we're just a bit too siloed. And as an organization, we're too hierarchical. So we spend loads of money on team away days to try and break it, but it's really hard to shatter that. Then flip that on its head. I was chatting to someone from a hospice the other day who said, um, we have found people can come and volunteer to clean up the garden, which means that families and kids 
it's it's where they come and play and spend time together. It's a really good day for the company to bring 20, 30 people to come and do some gardening and then hear a bit about the hospice. And sometimes we do it in a competitive way. So the overriding feedback we get is we mix up the groups. So the CEO is with the person who's just joined today. And someone actually said in feedback, this is the first time I've ever spent this amount of time with the CEO, apart from on our sort of stand up monthly meeting. We support the same football team. What a brilliant answer to the problem that the HR director said of, we really want to try and smash some of those and build better relationships internally. I have learnt that actually when we start hunting for these different times when a charity starts working with a company, it could be a volunteering day. It could be an away day they could do. It could be turning up to, at your special event, your glitzy gala, instead of something else. How did you feel then? Things are slightly different. Hi, it's Rob. And in case you work in high value fundraising, I wanted to let you know about our two most effective training programs. That's Corporate Partnerships Mastery and the Major Gifts Mastery Program. To give you a sense of the difference they can make, here's some lovely feedback we received from Asia Parekh about her experience of Corporate Partnerships Mastery. This is my first corporate fundraising position. I, I've never corporate fundraised before. I rely quite heavily on the things that Rob taught. Since being on the programme, the charity has managed to turn over 10 partnerships. We started off with one. While I was on the course with Rob, that one turned into six and now it's turned into 10. For the charity, the partnerships are worth around £10,000 each. And at 10, we have a total of £100,000 coming in. I would really, really recommend the programme. Absolutely do it. It's worth every penny. And I'm really, really grateful for having been on it. At the time of publishing, there are still a few places left for both programmes starting in October 2024. To find out more about either Corporate Partnerships Mastery or Major Gifts Mastery, go to brightspotfundraising.co.uk forward slash services. And if you have any questions, do get in touch. For now, let's get back to my conversation with Ben. Thanks, Ben. These are great examples. I guess listening to them, one place my brain goes is realizing lots of these just aren't going to work very well in an email at arm's length. They're not going to stand out very well. And yet, if ever you were able to get an informal chat, meet someone at that company for a quick coffee in Costa and catch up about things or potentially explore the idea of what partnerships could potentially do in conversation, these kinds of anecdotes absolutely could be appropriate and they could be really effective in helping someone see the bigger picture, the more holistic range of ways that partnerships are really valuable to companies. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Rob. Clearly, and we say this in lots of our other content too, the most powerful thing you can do is make sure you are in conversation with them when you do this, whether that is over the phone. We've had some great chats over the phone, over Zoom, or ideally over coffee in their office or in some situation, because some of these do just come across better in a, in a conversation. And, you know, there is a that worst case scenario. If, if I do have to write something down, if it is for an application or if it is for a particular proposal because they've asked for it and I need to bring this point to life, then it's precisely because you've you found these things that you might find the powerful quote in there. You might find the person saying, this is the first time I've ever spent an afternoon with my CEO or this was the best sales campaign we've ever had. There's what you call a big fat claim. There is a descriptive thing that you can use to bring that to life. That is the only time when you might choose to put these things in email. Uh, you're right, very much so. This is for conversations. There are two other big chunks I've noticed where charity partnerships create this level of comparison. One of them, you can even find yourself in many ways, is the feedback that you notice from customers, if it's to do with a product, or from staff or colleagues after the campaign or during the campaign or when you're doing things. And again, remember, we're looking for comparisons. So for instance, the book I talked about that Childline did with Marks and Spencers, if you actually went onto Marks and Spencers website, you can imagine it, you know the website, you can look at a product, it's got the little reviews. When we first clicked on the book, after about four weeks of sales, first of all, five stars. So we were like, this is good news. The book is coming up as five stars, but that's because people had then also reviewed it. So we clicked on the reviews and started scrolling through them. And what we realized was unusually, review after review after review mentioned Childline or the NSPCC 
It actually said, I'm so pleased this money goes to the NSPCC. I bought this because of child life. And it fascinated me that I promise you I hadn't paid my team to write the reviews. Like they were so good. I thought we had at one point. And what intrigued me was actually start looking at products on the websites of the company that could be partnered with you. Is that the norm for other products? <laughs> Do they normally get these sorts of reviews? Remember, this game is about comparison. What's it like for your product compared to others? We noticed unusually high numbers of conversations about the charity and about why people bought it. And it was high score too. Um, but the same goes for, I was talking to a charity who worked with a football brand and the football brand started putting out videos to talk about the campaign. The campaign was very much about awareness to help with prevention for this particular disease. And they found underneath this video, typically when they put a video on social media and on YouTube, there's quite a lot of toxic responses underneath it because it's football and that's what happens. When this video went on, the toxic responses nearly disappeared. People were talking about, oh gosh, my dad suffered from that. I suffered from that. What a good court. And again, in charity world, maybe we're used to when we play our video, nice content underneath it. So we might think that's normal. Remember comparisons. Look back at previous videos that your brand or your product has sent. Are they normal? Again, when I've had conversations with companies about this and they talk about engagement with things like Facebook videos or other stuff, that's when they start telling me we never normally get this level of engagement. We never get such warm comment. Again, back to finding those comparisons. The final one to look at is the feeling people get from working with you. <laughs> Enjoyment, pride, motivation. Like, And this is where a conversation with your companies or partners is crucial. I remember talking to a brand. They sent us this report with an, you know, analyzing engagement online and likelihood to click through on our videos. And it was beating previous campaigns, not by a massive amount, like eight to 17% was the, was the difference again. So that's great. It was, it was making a shift. When we got in a room with them, again, there was this sense that they loved working with us. One of the clues was they said, let's plan for the next year and the year afterwards. Like, I've noticed companies don't say that if there's not some reasons that they've liked working with you. So we are, we asked them, you know, as well as these engagement scores, what's it been like working with us? What, what have you enjoyed? What have you noticed that's been different? And this team was part of a massive brand. You know, when you see those brand maps online, when you realize that Mars and Coca-Cola own the world, like that they were part of one of these huge brands whose head office was in Switzerland. And they were a team of six on this tiny part of it. And they said for the first time ever, having worked on this product for years and years and years, for the first time ever, they were name checked on the international like call where everyone across the globe is tuned in. They were name checked for winning team of the month award for the campaign that they'd done with our charity. <laughs> and they said to be name checked by the global CEO, like you could just see one of the people who'd worked there for nine years, like his pride just came across again. Someone who worked at an organisation for nine years to get that. When we've talked to HR teams and they've done their uh, annual staff engagement survey, <laughs> they've said, Do you know, when someone gets a chance to write in the open text box, like an overwhelming amount of answers came from the partnership with your charity is the thing we're most proud of. The fundraising day with your charity was the thing that we were most proud of. Like there was just this clear comparison between a normal day and another day and I think, Rob, we've touched on this in the past, haven't we? Do you know, I think we forget in charity world because to us, oh God, organising a volunteering day is quite exhausting or doing the cycle ride is quite exhausting or planning the partnership is, it's just my day job. I think we forget that when they come into contact with our charity, it is a bright spot in their day, in their week, in their month. And I remember going to a drinks event many years ago, sitting on the table with someone who turned around to me and said, you know what, it was nine years earlier, he'd done a cycle ride for Help for Heroes. I think it was across France, across Normandy, across various different parts of, which makes sense for Help for Heroes. He said, I genuinely, I, he'd learned I work for a charity and he could not stop himself from saying, you should do this cycle ride. Like if your charity doesn't already do this cycle ride, Ben, you should do it. And he said, genuinely, 10 years on, the friends I made on that cycle ride in my company, we're still friends with now. Like, it was the best three weeks of my life. Like, I still remember that fondly, like what it felt like to do that. And his whole demeanor 
just shifted. Yeah, that's a really interesting way of looking at it, isn't it? Because clearly, people who don't work for charities, some of them just don't have that connection and or job satisfaction that we might sometimes, at some level, take a little for granted. And yet, if and when a company partners with our charity and through that initiative, people can connect to something really important, it's not a surprise that they feel different. Yeah. The other week I was talking to a fundraiser who asked, how do I, in a meeting, best understand what out of all these different areas, Ben? Sales numbers, engagement numbers, audience they're talking to, relationships internally, externally, feedback from customers, the feeling from their stuff. How do I figure out which bit I should talk to them about? And how do I get them to tell me some of their challenges? Because I ask in my meetings, I, I definitely try to ask them, what are your challenges and what are things we can help with? But they never seem to answer correctly. There's always a bit vague. And we were discussing it. And one of the things that I realised was from hunting out these examples, being part of them, hearing them, and a bit like you just described, noticing that the 45 minutes somebody spent talking to us about our cause, understanding our cause, understanding why it's so important for me for years helping children, but it could be any cause, why the stakes are so high and the impact we make, 45 minutes of that, compared to 45 minutes of talking about tax reductions or other things. I was, I'm 100% certain that after those 45 minutes, they are happier. They've had a better time. I am 100% certain if they partner with us, things are better. I realised that this sort of level of certainty changed the way that I would frame and talk about and, and introduce myself in a meeting, which in turn made the likelihood of that company to talk a bit more openly about their challenges. It, it, it just shifted. They were, they were more likely to do that. Thanks, Ben. So, of course, I highly recommend, if our listeners haven't done it already, doing some of the things that Ben has suggested in terms of somehow conversations with existing partners to find out the kinds of examples in any of these areas of, of how partnering with you is good for the company too. But then there is still an extra challenge when we are in front of a new company and they don't yet know yeah. that partnering with us is valuable. They are largely thinking about how philanthropic they could or could not be. And we, some level, need to help them believe this too. I know many fundraisers have tried just asking open questions and the company still doesn't quite get it and doesn't really talk about any of these challenges in terms of sales or brand or culture or whatever. But I know for years, Ben, you and your team and people you coach have quite deliberately set the frame early in a conversation with a new potential partner to help them believe and therefore be more likely to open yeah. up and answer open questions. Really top line, what are the two or three things you say? So immediately, something that we call a brief summary. So ho hopefully a 20 to 30 second example of, of, of who we are as a charity and what we do to help make an impact on the world and then crucially the only way that we can make this impact is if we work in partnership with other people other companies just like you and to us partnership doesn't just mean the company making an impact and of course they do you've transformed the lives of children in lots of ways what we've noticed is partnerships mean helping the company in another way too for instance with marks and spencers at christmas they had a book that they wanted to sell as part of the Paddington campaign. And the partnership they did with us made that book the fastest selling of 22 products. For instance, O2's partnership with the NSPCC didn't just keep millions of children safe online, but it meant that two thirds of families when buying their phones with O2, two thirds of them said they would extend their contract with O2 based on the partnership they had with the NSPCC. For instance, some companies even tell us that in their annual survey at the end of a year, their engagement scores are linked to the work they've done with a charity. But crucially, the easiest way for us to work together and build a partnership <laughs> that makes that sort of impact is to understand a bit more about you as a company. So I've noticed your you're advertising it. It looks like it's targeting these sorts of families. Is, is that right? Is that who you're going, who you're after? Or 
for your colleagues? Is there a challenge that they have? Right. I promise you, if you tell us a bit more, just like O2 did or Marks and Spencer's did, I could understand a bit more out of every single aspect of our work, of our partnerships, the things that we could work on together because we've got some exciting stuff. But anyway, I'm interested. What made you take the meeting today? What challenges do you have? And off you go. Um, and for me, Rob, I, I watched a master do this many years ago one of my first ever ma managers in corporate fundraising. And he would just pick, he'd just pick two of his favorite examples of where he'd noticed feedback and comparisons of where partnerships with us had made an impact on, th on those companies, whether it was advertising value equivalency <laughs> or staff engagement. And he would very quickly say, these two partnerships, for instance, don't just raise this money and make this impact they found it's as impactful as them spending advertising money. They found it's as impactful as creating team days or restructures to do with culture. So I'm interested, tell me more. What are some of the challenges you've got? What are some of the things your staff talk to you about and how can we help? And it was like he'd sprinkled magic dust because suddenly the people, I think by sharing those stories, their brain understood where we were coming from and what we were talking about when we said a partnership with us isn't just one-sided. I think you do need some of these examples. And early on in my career, before we had our own examples, this is also where I would use the fairy liquid example. And, and you know what, just one other example, I've been in conferences, online conferences, where directors of CSR and ESG have talked about how partnerships they've had with other charities have helped with staff retention and staff recruitment. And I've used those examples in my brief summary. I said, I've even, I've been to a conference and heard the director of Sky say, the more people who volunteer for charities, the more likely it is that they retain their stuff. Like, so I'm interested. What are some of the challenges you've got? Is it staff retention? Is it audit? Because I, I am confident if we find the right thing, we can help. Like it doesn't necessarily need to be your own example. It can come from somewhere else, but practice, see, see what it feels like at the beginning of a meeting to calmly give these examples, because I've noticed, like, I think we said very early on, finding these examples does help to give certainty to the company, but crucially you'll notice the way you talk, what you believe, how you even manage that meeting will be different. Because you're a, like, I, I often say this in my training, the more I hunt these out, the more I am 100% convinced if a company chooses to partner with us, I can make their life better. I'm not here with a begging bowl. I'm not here to queue. I'm here to tell you, if you partner with our charity, I can make your life better. I can make your customer's life better. I can make your staff's life better. If you have to, if it's not too icky, your shareholders will be happier. And crucially, by doing this, you will transform our work. You will help more children be answered. You'll help the environment to get better. You'll help us reach more people. Campaigns will change. It, partnerships work. The more you hunt these out, the more it changes your state, the more likely it is in this meeting. It comes across in a more congruent way when you say this stuff, because you believe it, the more they believe it, the easier this gets. Fabulous, Ben. And yes, the key point you're saying there is when you are a hundred percent convinced and the finding of any of these examples can only increase that sense of certainty or, or how convinced you are when you are that certain going into a conversation with someone who's less certain than you about whether partnerships do or don't help if you really as long as you're a good listener as well and you care about the, the company you're meeting and the person you're meeting over time if there's any rapport at all between you and them your certainty that partnering with you or at least having another cup of coffee with you is in the interests of them and the company, Yeah. over time, they too will feel more of that and they'll become more certain too. And they'll start start absolutely enjoying these conversations and, and believing the same thing. And ultimately, I love that you found it works to share examples of other charity partners yeah. that clearly were good for both parties. I think that's such an important point. And in the meantime, also, if there's a starting point for any of our listeners that sense there is a value to this, and the starting point is finding a way today or tomorrow to get an extra new conversation with an existing partner, if currently they do have a partner, to just have this type of conversation. And you might be surprised that actually mm. there is some kind of anecdote or even crunchier 
number that they never that, that they haven't proactively shared with you yet. Ben, I need to finish. Thank you so much for sharing all these wonderful examples and your insight and even that little recipe right at the end for how you tend to frame it when you're meeting a company. I look forward to catching up with you soon for another chat for the podcast. But in the meantime, Ben Swart, thank you and bye-bye. There you go. I hope you found Ben's tips and examples helpful. As we always do, we'll put a summary in the episode notes on the podcast section of our Brightspot website and links to some other shows to help corporate fundraisers. If you haven't already subscribed to our show, do click that subscribe button now. You'll get instant access to dozens more techniques and stories to help you with your fundraising, including lots more on corporate fundraising and several more great episodes with Ben. And if you'd like to find out more about our two famous programs, that's Corporate Partnerships Mastery that I teach with Ben, or the Major Gifts Mastery program, which have now helped hundreds and hundreds of people to grow their skill and confidence and raise more money over the last 10 years. We're now taking bookings for the next programs. Please be aware, we know from long experience that these courses always sell out. So if you'd like to find out more, please do it today if you can. All the info is at brightspotfundraising.co.uk forward slash services. If you found today's show helpful, please don't keep quiet about it. I'd be incredibly grateful if you could share it on with your friends, your colleagues, and on LinkedIn. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for spreading the word so that we can help as many good causes as possible. Ben and I would love to hear from you. On X, Ben is at Ben Swart, and I am at Woods underscore Rob, and we're both on LinkedIn. Thank you so much for listening and supporting the Fundraising Bright Spots show. Good luck with your fundraising, and I can't wait to share more Bright Spot stories with you very soon. Bye.